topic on, on graph drawing, graph visualization. Today with a topic called schematic graph layout and I will explain on the following slides what I mean with, by, by schematic in comparison to what we did yesterday with the straight line drawing. Um, and yeah, I would say let's just start. So this is the layout problem that we had seen yesterday. Yeah, so given a graph, find a drawing and that drawing needs to satisfy the drawing conventions optimize some kind of aesthetics. For example, yesterday we optimized the area. We tried to find minimum area drawings um, and also maybe satisfy some local constraints. So what we are going to look at today is uh, schematic layers and I mean this in the sense of angular restrictions on the slopes of the edges. Yeah, so for example, the most, most typical regular schematic angular systems are the rectilinear or orthogonal system where you can only use horizontal and vertical edges or maybe polylines consisting of uh, orthogonal edges with a couple of bends. Um, you can extend this to any number of uh, directions that you like. Um, we will also look at the octilinear setting where you can use the diagonals because this is um, used in, in many applications, for example, subway networks, you often see this. Okay, so um, usually angular restrictions like this is not something that we want to optimize, but something that we give as a drawing convention saying that now we search for drawings in that style and please do not draw any edges with a different slope. Uh, sometimes you find methods where they maybe define some kind of optimization function that tries to put edges to these orientations but there's no guarantee. We're not looking at this kind of heuristic way of modeling um, schematic graphs but doing it um, yeah, in a guaranteed um, and rigid fashion. So the first half of the course today will be about orthogonal graph drawing which is a very popular theme in, in the graph drawing literature. So if you check, you will find very early uh, works um, studying this orthogonal scheme. And, and also many of the schematics that you maybe have seen for UML diagrams that I showed yesterday use exactly this orthogonal drawing style. Okay, so this is again a couple of pictures that show how orthogonal drawings are frequently used in, in practice. So I know this is some entity relation diagram that you would find in the OGDF library. OGDF is one of the C++ libraries um, that are open source for graph drawing. Um, UML diagrams we have already seen. Many of these uh, circuit diagrams also use an orthogonal style. And you will see some edges maybe that are diagonal, but most of them are orthogonal. Um, and then if you have some hierarchy diagrams of organizations with uh, the different levels in, in their administration, then frequently you also see orthogonal edges. Okay. The question now is if we want to compute orthogonal drawings, what do we try to achieve? What do we want to optimize? And here typically the criteria are just yes, kind of use few bends. Okay. If we have orthogonal edges, sometimes you need to use bends. That's kind of clear because otherwise the vertices can only be um, basically on four directions from, a, from one vertex. We also want to optimize or try to achieve short edges, so do not expand the drawing for too large area. And basically short edges and compact drawings somehow fits together. Yeah. So let's try to minimize number of bends and make the drawing somehow compact without squeezing it. So the, the way of doing compactness is like yesterday. Usually you apply some uh, underlying grid and then it's clear that you cannot put anything into a tiny space. Okay, and um, the most, way most popular framework for drawing orthogonal layouts is this so-called topology shape matrix framework. Uh, so um, this comes from Tamasia already in 1987 um, and it has the idea that if you have a graph and you want to compute an orthogonal drawing, you can subdivide this process into three steps, fixing the topology, fixing the shape and then fixing the matrix. So what does it mean? We start with some graph again, like we, we did yesterday. The first step would be this graph does not come with any embedding of any topology. Yeah? So what we need to do is find the right embedding that we want to have for our graph layout, which could mean that if it is a planar graph, find the right way of um, getting the rotation scheme. Um, if it is a non-planar graph, which might also happen, then this is the step where you might do planarization. Yeah? So find a drawing with few edge crossings. If you have an edge crossing, then make it into a dummy vertex. And in that sense, you would end up with a planar graph with an embedding after that step. 
Yeah, so now, after that step, we know how the graph is embedded, and we know all the cyclic orderings of the edges. The next step is the one where we go from this abstract topological embedded graph to one that has kind of an orthogonal representation, not yet a drawing. Okay? What this means is we want to compute some kind of structure that represents well how the bends are distributed on the edges in a way that is, it is consistent and we can make this into a proper layout. And then this is the step where you do bend minimization. Yeah. And once you have this abstract representation, then the last step is usually the compaction step or metric assignment step where you now need to decide for every segment of an edge how long this will be drawn. Okay, so if, if this would be the, the abstract representation, we try to make this compact. You can see, okay, every edge is at least one unit long. That's our underlying grid. So we can actually draw this graph in a two by two grid. Yeah. And this is the last step. Um, today, we, we are not going to see all the steps because that um, can, can fill easily two lectures. Um, we focus on this spent minimization step because it uses a different technique that we have not seen so far and that um, maybe is interesting. Then I will quickly sketch what happens if we do area minimization but the main focus is on, on the bent representation. Okay. So the bent minimization with fixed embedding problem, if we want to formalize this, is now we're given a planar graph with some embedding. And also this graph has a certain degree property, namely that the maximum degree is 4. Why is this? Well, the thing is if we have a vertex, we can only use four outgoing edges. And we do not want any overlaps. Yeah? So basically, this restricts ourselves to just having at most four neighbors. Yeah? There's other models um, for, for graphs with larger degree where you maybe represent a vertex by a little box. And if you have a box, you can have multiple edges on each side. Yeah? So this is a different model, typically called Kandinsky model in the literature, um, in case you, you need this for something. But today, we look at um, the standard model where a vertex is a point and then this is the max degree condition. Um, okay, we also know the embedding, so we know all the faces and we know all the outgoing edges in their order and we want to find an orthogonal grid drawing that maintains the same embedding and has a minimum number of bends. Yeah, so we want the smallest number of bends possible. So. As we said, we are kind of separating this combinatorial description of the bands from the geometric um, representation. And if we care about the combinatorial band minimization, then we don't need the drawing immediately, but we want some orthogonal representation H, and I will explain what it means, um, that has the same embedding and kind of represents fewest number of bands. Okay, so the orthogonal representation is something that is very similar to, um, to the embedded graph. But for each edge, we now have also some, um, some strings that describe the shape of that edge. Okay? Um, so we're given a planar graph, set of faces, and we know the external face, and we want for every face of the graph some face description. And this H of F is a clockwise ordered sequence of the edges. So again, we, we have a face. Maybe let's do like a short example here. Um, So if this is a phase of, of your graph, um, let's call it F, um, then we start maybe with one edge E1, and we want to go clockwise today, so D2, E3, and E4. So this means we need description for these four edges, and they come in that cyclic order, in order to maintain <coughs> the orientation. Um, and now for each edge, we have a, a triple um, that gives, well, the edge name, then a string delta, and delta is just a sequence of zeros and ones with the meaning that a zero represents a right turn and a one represents a left turn. Okay, so if you have an edge um, that is maybe oriented like this, we would have a right turn which is a zero and then a left turn which is a one. Okay? And then finally what we need to store is the angle to the next edge because the bend can happen um, either at a vertex or on the edge. And so if the next um, edge of our face would somehow continue here, then we measure the angle at this 
internal vertex. Okay, and this would be, ah, okay, now we want it to go clockwise. So maybe let's do it on the other side. I'm sorry. That's correct. So here we have this pi over 2 angle. And then we continue. Okay? So you can have yes. 2 pi and it means it can come back on um, 2 pi is, is a bit special. As you say, this can happen if you have a leaf. Um, and if you, if you uh, maybe let's do an example. So maybe you have a face where something sticks in. And now if you walk clockwise, you would see that edge twice. Kind of the left side and the other, and then there's the two pi. Yes. But, but if, if it's a biconnected graph, you don't have this kind of structure, then the two pi case doesn't happen. OK, so this is a kind of larger example to see again what's happening. It's a small graph with three faces. Um, and these would be the face descriptors up there that you can see. So of course, if we go to F2, for example, we have um, E5, 6, 3, and 4. 5, 6, 3, and 4, that's the right order. And now, here we have some kind of strings that represent some of number of bends. Yeah? So here we have three right turns on the first edge, two left turns on the second edge, no turn here, no turn here. And you see the angles are 90 degree, 90 degree, 180, 90. So if you, if you take this description and you try to draw this on a piece of paper, you would be able to come up with a drawing, which then looks like, like this. So we can maybe just pick the face F1 and see whether that is actually uh, matching our description here. So here we have E1, which is this edge, which has two right turns. Yes, these are the two zeros. Then we have E2, which has no turn. Oh, wait, this is 3 pi over 2 angle here. So that's this concave corner here. Then a, an edge that is straight and has a pi over 2 <coughs> angle to the next one, this, this one. And E6, again, has two right turns. And if you do this for all of them, you will see that this is the right um, combinatorial drawing for... I mean, this is actually a geometric drawing because we cannot show it combinatorial on, this, on the screen. Um, but that's actually representing everything here. So one, one thing is maybe the order of the outer phase F0 somehow seems to be the wrong order. Yeah? Because here we have E1, E5, E4, E1, E5, E4. That's, that's not clockwise. But you need to take the position of being inside this outer face, and then it is actually the clockwise order. Yeah? Because for, for all the closed faces, it, you have this view, and then it matches. But if you're on the outside, um, you need to yeah, orient yourself differently. So that's still correct. Um, and um, now we can also attach the different um, angles at the vertices, um, matching what we see up here. and. Um, I think what we then can show is that basically the concrete coordinates are not fixed. Okay, So these two drawings that you see here flipping, of course, both represent exactly the same orthogonal description. Yeah? And then the metric step will make edges short and compact. OK. So um, in order to show that um, such an orthogonal representation is correct, you need to s make sure that it uh, corresponds to the face structure of the embedding that you're given. That's clear. Um, then we also need to make sure that if you have an edge that is usually shared by exactly two faces, then the two sequences of bends, they need to match, right? If we take an edge in one face and say it has two right turns, then if you're in the other face, it needs to have two left turns, otherwise it doesn't match. Yeah? So if you have UV with some string delta and some angle in the face F and VU, so the opposite edge, uh, with some string delta 2 in the phase G, then delta 1 is just a reversed and inverted sequence of delta 2. Yeah, because you, you see this in the opposite order. So this is U, and this would be V. And then here, this is a 0 and this is a 1, if you're oriented like that. And if you're standing in the other phase, then first you see a 0 and then you see a 1. So if, if that doesn't match, then you cannot make a, a reasonable drawing out of this. The next thing is that somehow you need to close the faces with the number of bends that you consider. Yeah. And this is the condition that we see here. So what this means is that if you take the number of zeros in your string delta, number of right turns, or the number of, of left turns, um, and we have r to be one of these triples, then what we can um, do for each of these triplets is to add up the number of right turns 
subtract the number of left turns and see what is the angle that we do with the next edge. Okay, and the angles where I represented is as pi over two or pi. So we sub we divide by pi to go to go back to that meaning or the interpretation that a unit of one means one ninety degree turn to the right. Okay. Um, and this is basically giving us the net turn of that edge R with respect to the ne next edge. Um, and if you now sum up all these values for the edges of the same of one face, then we need to close the face. In order to close the face, we need to do a net turn of four right turns. And then you close the cycle. Um, so the requirement here is that if you sum up all these expressions, it must be four for all the internal faces. For the outer face, it's again a special case because you basically need um, need to make um, yeah, four left turns to make this fit in that model. Yeah. Is that clear, or do you want to see an example? Of this? Okay. Good. Um, and then finally, we also need to make sure that for each vertex, some of the angles match. Okay, because for for a vertex, um, maybe we have one vertex that has three edges, um, then we make sure that these three angles add up to 2 pi or 2, 360. So you, ca you cannot assign pi over 2 here, here, and here, and then hope that this will give a drawing. Okay, so for each vertex, the sum of angles needs to be 2 pi. And now the idea of computing such an orthogonal description uh, or representation is to use a network flow model. Yeah, so we, we use a network flow model and then have the idea that one unit of flow in this model, so when I show you how this model looks like, always think of a unit of flow means a 90 degree angle, so an angle of pi over 2. Um, we want flow from vertices to faces because every vertex basically has to spend four units of flow and these can be distributed in the adjacent faces. Um, and we also ha might have flow between different faces and this is exchange of bands from one phase to the next in order to make sure that the total number of bands matches this uh, sum of four that we had seen. Okay. So I don't know how familiar everyone here is with flow networks. This is just one slide repeating, but I hope you have seen flow, flow network modeling in, in your courses. So you mean that you are somehow working with the dual? Uh, this dual will be some kind of dual graph, yes. We, ha we have vertices for phases. You, you will see how it looks like. Um, so flow network is a graph, a directed graph that has additional um, information with the edges. So every edge has some capacity that uh, is an upper bound of how much flow we can transport on that edge. Um, in an ST flow model, we also have a single source vertex and a single sink vertex T. And now a function that maps flow to edges is called a flow if it um, satisfies the following properties. So for every edge UV in your flow network, the flow it must be at least zero um, and cannot exceed the capacity of that edge. Yeah, that's the capacity bound. And now we want that for, for every vertex in this flow network, the inflow matches the outflow. Yeah, so that's the flow condition. So if you add up all the outgoing flow from, um, from one vertex um, minus the incoming flow or vice versa, um, then this needs to be zero. This is not true for the source and sink, but for all the internal vertices, whatever flow comes in needs to go out. Um, and if you do not have this ST flow network, but something more general, um, then it's slightly different because we now can even put uh, lower capacities on edges. So we can enforce that a certain edge has at least one unit, two units of flow. This will be helpful for us. Um, and for every, because we now have, don't have s uh, sources and sinks, every vertex can either produce some flow or consume some flow and take it out of the network. Yeah? So for every vertex um, in the graph, now you have some kind of uh, production or consumption value with the property that if you add this up over all vertices of the graph, it needs to be zero. Okay? And then the conditions for the valid flow is very similar. The flow on each edge must be between the lower and the upper bound of the capacities. Um, and for every internal or for every vertex of the graph, um, the outgoing flow minus the incoming flow now needs to be this value B of here. Yeah, so if it's zero, it's like in the regular flow network. If it's um, positive, it means that we produce flow. And if it's negative, it means we consume flow. 
Okay, um, typically for, for flow networks, you're interested either in the existence of a valid flow that um, matches all the capacity bounds, or you want to, to minimize some costs of the flow. That's the second problem, and this is the one that we are going to use for the network uh, visualization. So if we have additionally a cost function on, every, on the arcs of the flow network, um, then the cost of a particular flow is to just go over all the arcs of the network check how many units of flow we send over that edge, multiply this with the cost of a flow on that particular edge. So some edges can be cheaper, others can be more expensive, and then we want to find the best minimum value here. Um, yes, so find the valid flow that satisfies the conditions and minimizes the total cost. That's the problem we are going to use, and now let's see how we can construct a flow network from this orthogonal, um, for this orthogonal graph problem. The flow network consists of um, vertices, and the vertices of the flow network um, are the vertices of our graph, V, and the vertex for every face. So you see it's similar to the dual, so we represent faces um, as vertices in our flow network. And then we have a number of, of arcs. We will see which of them, and we need to define all the capacity bonds. So the arcs come in two flavors, the blue arcs and the red arcs. <coughs> And the blue ones, um, they connect every vertex to all adjacent faces of that vertex. So if you have a vertex that is part of three faces, then we have three arcs going from that vertex to all three neighboring faces. Um, and the red edges are edges that um, connect two neighboring faces. Um, basically, like in a dual graph sense, um, but now this is actually a multigraph. So if two faces, F and G, share three edges on their, bound on their common boundary, we have three of those edges. Yeah, so um, this is why we put this little uh, index E with the edge so that we can distinguish that between F and G. Right? We have a dual edge to E, a dual edge to E prime, a dual edge to E double prime, and so on. Um, yes, so this is an example where, where you can see how this works. So the blue edges, for example, I don't show all of them, but this vertex now is um, incident to the big phase basically twice, yeah, because if you follow the sequence, you visit that vertex twice. And this also means that we have two of the blue edges from V to F. Um, and the red edges, I think here I showed those between F and G. F and G in this example share two edges. The blue triangle has two edges in common with the brown phase F. And for every phase, uh, we have the two pairs. Um, so basically, there's, there's four edges between F and G, two from F to G, and two from G to F. And that's important because for every edge, we need to represent shape. Um, so now we come to this uh, production and consumption of flow. For every vertex of the graph, we produce four units of flow. And maybe you already have an idea why this is four. A unit of flow is 90 degree. And one vertex needs to spend four 90-degree angles. And this is um, how, how these four angles are produced. Um, faces are consuming angles, or consuming units of flow. Um, so for all the internal faces, this is minus two times the degree of the face, so just the number of edges, minus two. And for the outer face, there was this, this kind of special case. Um, we have a plus two over here instead of minus two. And this should then map to counting all the angles around the face and making sure that this adds up to a net turn of, of 360 degrees. So um, now the question is, in order for this to be a valid flow network, we need this property that if we add up all the production and consumption, it must be zero. And um, maybe we can quickly sketch why that is the case. Um, so, let's see, if we do this um, for all vertices W, then remember that our vertex set consists of the, the vertices union the faces. Okay? So we can maybe split this into the two pieces. So this is the sum of all the vertices of our graph. And here all of those values are 4, right? Um, so maybe we can even directly put a 4 here. And then for the other vertices, which are actually the faces of our graph, 
Um, what we have, we have um, two times the degree of the phase. Um, and if you take this minus with this minus, it's getting a plus, so plus 4. And for each phase, we add this 4. Right? And now we did the mistake, because the outer phase is different. So we subtracted two units here. In order to correct for this, we need to add so we had four, but times two, we had eight. Okay. Um, so if we subtract eight, we correct for this. Okay. So what do we get here? We get four times the number of vertices. Um, and then we have the degree of the faces, this simply counts the edges, right? But of course every edge is seen twice, once from the, what, the left side, once from the right side. So we see every edge twice and multiply by two. So this is minus two times the number of edges, uh, minus four times the number of edges. Okay? And then in the end we add four times the number of faces and then minus eight. And this is maybe something that you have seen. Yeah, yeah it's Euler's formula um, times, times 4. Yeah. Yeah. So of course this is 0 by Euler. Okay. And that's good because this is the property that we need for the network. Okay. Um, and now we also need to define um, the capacities and the costs for our network to make sense. Okay. And um, for every edge that connects two neighboring faces, what do we want? We want units of flow to represent angles or bends. And if we have an edge going from F to G, that means how many right turns we can make on that particular edge. In terms of capacities, well, it's not necessary to put a bend on every edge, right? So we, we might ideally have many edges without bends. So the lower bound here should certainly be zero. Yeah? But we cannot really give a proper upper bound on how many bends can be on some edge. Uh, so, so you can either put there infinity if you don't care about an upper bound. The costs will make sure that we, we don't spend too many. Um, yes, and because we want to minimize bends in our drawing, we should put one unit of cost for every bend that we spend. Okay, so the cost for such an edge needs to be one. Okay, what about the edges going from vertex to faces? These are basically the four angles that we need, the four units of angles that we can spend at vertices. Um, but uh, we want to make sure that um, no two edges overlap. So we cannot actually have a zero on, on one of those edges. So here's where we need that the lower bound is also one. But of course, we cannot spend more than four. Yeah, so upper bound would be four. And the question is, does it make sense to put costs here? These are angles at vertices. They don't matter for band minimization. So flow on these edges does not cost anything. Okay? Now that would be the definition of the flow network for, for band minimization. Um, and we can see in, in the same example that we had before how this flow network looks like and um, what we actually get. So um, first thing is, the set of vertices is the white vertices from the graph and the three yellow ones from the faces. So somehow yes. you would, uh, would you say, is there integer program at some point? Um, no, this is, uh, this is flow network. So, I mean, so we, uh, we need to find the result as the integer from the graph. Yes. So but um, this, this will happen, even if you do just, just the regular flow. Um, Right, so this is the, the set of vertices that we have. Um, the blue edges are those edges that go from a vertex to a face. And as we said, go to all incident faces. Um, then the yellow edges, I don't show, wait, I think I, I sketch all of them. So for every edge, um, you have this pair of edges going from, from the face to the other and vice versa. And this is where uh, bends can, can be produced. 
Then we can add the uh, B of V values for all vertices. Yeah? So all the white vertices get four. And now the faces, this was the degree of the face minus two times minus two. So this was this is a triangle which has degree three. Minus two is one times minus two is minus two. This is a square, so or a qu uh, like four cycle that gets minus four. And the outer face had this uh, plus two instead of minus two, so it will get a high value. This is minus 14 in this case. So now um, we know that the lower and upper bound for the blue edges is um, one and four and no cost. And um, for the yellow edges, lower bound is zero, upper bound is unbounded, and the cost unit is one. And um, we can now try to to spend the first units of flow that we, we certainly need. So flow I put now in, in green. Every, every vertex needs to spend um, four units of flow. So certainly in this triangle area, there's at least one unit here, at least one unit here, and at least one unit here. And so this is three ingoing, but we only consume two. So one unit of flow needs to go to the outside. And for example, you can put this unit on, say, this edge. And what it means is that you draw this triangle with one bent edge. Okay. For the others, for example, if you spend one unit from each of those vertices, this face is happy, and drawing a four cycle without bends is easy. Um, all the remaining flow needs to go to the outer face, but if you now add up all these numbers, three, two, three, this one unit of flow, two and three, you will see it's 14. Yeah, so this would be a valid um, flow on this network, and you can also argue that it's the best possible flow. Because the only cost that we have is this edge with one unit. And there's no way you can satisfy this face without spending one unit of flow over one of the edges. OK. And this one unit means it's a bend to the outside. So now um, the, the theorem that we want to have here is that um, if you have a planar embedded graph, with a valid orthogonal description, this is exactly the case. Uh, with, with k bands, this is exactly the case if the flow network that we have constructed has a flow with cost of k. Yeah, so we have to show two directions given some flow in the network. Do we find a corresponding orthogonal representation? And given, given an orthogonal representation, can we find a corresponding flow? So if we, if we start with the flow, we need to construct a suitable representation with k bands. In order to do this, we need to transform it into the orthogonal representation and show that the four properties, h1 to h4, actually hold. Um, so maybe, maybe we can quickly sketch how, um, how you do this for taking one edge E delta and maybe an angle alpha, which is part of some um, phase f. So, so to go to the phase structure and the edges, that's, that's the easy part because the flow network was constructed in a way that it corresponds. But now the flow that we have computed, how does that transform into um, bends and angles? Um, so here, if we have the sequence delta, then we can simply say that this is a number of zeros followed by a number of ones. Okay, and the zeros we simply get from the flow that goes from phase F to F to phase G, and the number of ones corresponds to the flow that goes from G to F. I mean, of course, now you may ask, does that ever make sense to have zeros and ones? Because it would mean you transport flow from F to G and then back from G to F, and flow costs. Of course, in a minimum cost flow, this will never happen. And so either there's only left turns or only right turns. Um, but in general, yeah, a valid flow might, might have that property. And we can distribute the turns in a way that we do all the right turns first and then all the left turns. Um, and the angle alpha E, well, this simply is uh, we, we check the, the flow from the particular vertex to the face and multiply this by pi over 2. OK, so if, if this is our vertex. <coughs> This is our edge. Um, <coughs> then here we see this angle alpha. Okay. 
So the flow corresponds one to one to the bends and basically the descriptions that we have here. Um, and if you check everything carefully, then we, we, we will see that the number of bends that we have is just the sum of all the cost units that we had. Yeah, so, so that's kind of um, easy to see. And the second step is that if we have given an orthogonal description of our network, does that correspond to a valid flow with the same cost? Um, and um, yeah, here what we need to define is a flow that matches, and um, then we need to show that X is a valid flow. But this is also um, not difficult. So for, for flow from vertex to face, we simply assign a value of 1, 2, 3, or 4, depending on this angle alpha e between e and e prime, so the neighboring edge. If this has uh, pi over 2 angle, then we set the value of 1 for the flow. If it's pi, then we set 2 and so on. And um, for the flow between two phases, f and g, we simply count the number of zeros in the delta description of that particular edge. Yeah, and then that will give you the flow of that particular edge. So what you need then to do is to check whether all the capacity bounds are satisfied, um, whether the flow conservation is true, um, and um, whether the cost is actually k. Yeah, for the flow conservation, you need to check for every vertex whether the sum adds up to b of v. But because this comes from um, an orthogonal description that is valid, for example, if you have a vertex v, of course the angles match, so in total you will only spend at most exactly exactly four units of flow. And for each phase, you you check the angles of the of the bends and the vertices, and this is in a way that if you sum up all of them, you will have this net turn of uh, 360 degrees, but of course if you have um, in between bends or angles of uh, 180 degrees, these will add up units of cost. But we did not say that um, the consumption of a phase is, is 4. We said it's the degree of the phase um, minus 2 times minus 2. Yeah? And this is constructed in a way that it simply matches that, that idea. Yeah? We don't go through the detailed proof now. Okay. So, if you want to summarize this, then what it implies is that the combinatorial orthogonal band minimization problem um, for embedded planar graphs we can solve by using a min cost flow algorithm. And you asked whether we use integer programming or anything for this. Um, so, min cost flow on such a network, you can, you can do actually with min cost flow algorithms. Yeah, and if the capacities are all integer, and the cost is integer, then you will get a solution that is integral. Yeah. Um, so the best running time for this is actually n to the 7 divided by 4 times root of log n. Um, but actually, the flow network that we have here is special in the sense that it's a planar flow network. And um, for planar flow network, there's faster algorithm um, from Cornelsen and Karrenbauer, 2012, that showed that this can actually be done in n to the 1.5. Uh, using the planarity. Okay, um, maybe some remarks aside. This is starting with the combinatorial embedding. If you optimize over all possible embeddings of the graph, the number of bends, then this is an NP-hard problem. Uh, so the restriction to fix an embedding and then optimize that makes sense algorithmically because otherwise you run into NP-hardness. And um, maybe just to like a, a more recent result connected to that case of orthogonal drawings is that, um, for example, if you want to decide whether a graph has an orthogonal drawing um, with at most some number of bends per edge, so you give upper bounds on the number of bends per edge that you want to spend, because maybe some edges are so important you want them straight, so maybe you put f to 0 or to 1 or to 2. Other edges are less important if they have many bends, that's fine. Um, Yes. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Um, and you can solve this in polynomial time if you allow to spend at least one bend on each edge. Uh, if if this f is zero, um, then then you basically run into that problem. 
Okay, so this is basically a sketch of uh, how we can minimize bands. So we, we take this graph with an embedding, model it as a flow network, and solve the min cost flow problem here. Um, the next step now would be to minimize the area. And maybe let me just mention um, roughly how this method works. So it's again, um, depending on, on how the, the um, faces are shaped, you can use a network flow model if all faces are rectangles. That's not hard to, to, to see what's going on here, because if all faces are rectangles of your combinatorial description, then um, you can do a horizontal flow network and independently a vertical flow network that assigns basically um, the length to the edges. So every unit of flow is one length unit. And if faces are rectangles, then the flow conservation helps, because the side of the left edge needs to be exactly the side length of the right edge in a rectangle. And flow conservation gives us that. Property. Okay, so if you if you compute a min cost flow, you will with this step you will get the height minimum solution. If you do it independently for that, you will get the width minimal solution. And because in orthogonal drawings you can change height and width independently from each other, um, this will give you a minimum area drawing then. Um, using again the planar flow network algorithm and for rectangular faces, that's fine. If you do not have rectangular faces, then this area minimization problem is actually NP-hard. Okay, so if, if your faces are arbitrary shape, there's, uh, there's heuristics that um, maybe try to take this orthogonal representation and subdivide com more complex faces into rectangles, then apply this algorithm and then remove these uh, separation edges, but this will not give you the, the best solution necessarily. Um, People have studied exact algorithm for the area minimization problem, for example, now using ILP, which is able to do uh, to solve NP-hard problems. Um, and if your instances are not too large, um, that might be fine. Um, but there's also many heuristics for area minimization and also experimental algorithmic work that um, tests these heuristics on sample graphs and measures how good the area compaction is actually working. Um, yes, if you have non-planar graphs, so you need to do <coughs> planarization. Um, then even approximation is hard. Yeah, so it's uh, a constant factor is out of reach here. All right. Um, questions about the orthogonal part so far? Otherwise, we can also discuss in the in the coffee uh, break. Yes. Uh, for the finding this initial Yes. Oh, wait, if, you, if you know the graph is planar, you don't need to planarize. Planarization is something when you have a non-planar graph and you need to define where the crossings happen. This is what we call planarization. If you have a planar graph, yes, you need to find an embedding. Yes. I mean, there, there can be a, a large number of embeddings. That's, that's why it's a, a difficult search problem. Um, of course, there's, there's um, finding just some embedding. That's not difficult. And then using that embedding and running the algorithm. But you don't know whether that is an embedding that is uh, good for area and bends. Yes. So this is tricky. Yeah. So for, for, for bi-connected uh, graphs, there's um, a data structure called SPQR tree. I don't know if anyone has heard of this. And this is a, a data structure that for biconnected uh, graphs in, in a tree data structure kind of represents all possible embeddings of that graph. And this is sometimes useful um, to, to optimize over embeddings. But in this particular case, it does not help. Yeah. And this data structure basically tells you that, that in some phases you can only mirror them as one operation. For other phases, maybe you can find permutations of internal edges. Um, it's, it's a very useful data structure if you deal with planar graphs. Yeah. SPQR tree. Well, no, you, you, you have many, many options in the tree of... of um, I know, but the yeah. two adjacent, yes. the distance between two adjacent, yes. only one operation? Um, I think you can have... 
So P nodes means it's a kind of a parallel construction um, where, where you maybe have um, um, a separation pair uh -huh. and then many graphs in between uh -huh. kind of forming these loons. And now you can do any permutation here. Yes. Yeah, so, so a P node in that tree represents now all permutations of this thing. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh -huh. Yes, that's a good question. It's, it's not clear. Because if you do this uh, framework step, you take priority order on, on these three criteria. Um, and if you do band minimization before area minimization, you can only minimize area subject to that selected band representation. Um, so maybe it's a, it's a good exercise to try to find a representation with one extra band that has smaller area. Yeah. But you're right, this is kind of... Um, a sequence of many NP-hard problems um, and you just need to decide in which order you do them. Yeah. But, but you cannot do area minimization before you, you know the, the kind of combinatorial structure. So in, in this case it makes sense to do it exactly in that way. Um, but you're right, I mean we, we will not probably not talk about um, directed graph layout um, in a hierarchical way but this is a similar framework where you have five different steps Four of them are NP-hard, and of course, whatever you do heuristically, maybe for the first three steps, influences how good you can be in the fourth step. Yeah. That's, that's the challenge. Yes. Okay, so for the last, um, I think we have like 20 minutes, right? Or uh, uh, yep, uh, when, when did we start? Oh, 15, sorry, 15. 15 20 minutes. Yeah, that's fine. so we started at 10 past, I think. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I want to sketch a little bit about um, using now extra edge directions, namely the diagonals. Um, for an application problem, namely the layout of, of subway maps or metro maps. So um, this is the historic uh, example of, of the London tube map, which basically was the first uh, in the 1930s to develop a schematic layout for the different lines in the subway. Yeah? And this guy that you see here, Henry Beck, was, was an engineer or draftsman who who was used to doing technical drawings of circuit diagrams and he thought, yeah, maybe why not draw the tube network like that? And the public immediately loved it. Um, this is how, how many, like 90, 95% of the subway networks today follow this style that Henry Beck invented, basically. So a metro map is basically a graph layout or graph dia map diagram that shows how different stations are connected by metro lines with a clear focus on the topology of the network and not so much about the topography. Because if you're sitting in a train in a tunnel, you don't really care what's above you. Um, and the goals, there's basically two tasks that users want to do with this map. They need to decide how do I get from my current station to my destination. Um, and in the ages before smartphones, you had to look at the map and see what is the best route, where do I change. I mean, now you can ask your device to suggest the route, but sometimes connection underground is not so great, so it's still useful to, to be able to do this visually. And then when you're sitting on the train, you want to follow the course of stations and find out where do you need to get off not to, to miss your connection train. In order to do that in an easy to read way, you can of course now distort the scale of the map. So you, of course you have an underlying map, but you see how, well, how much this is distorted to get to a schematic map. Um, Today, this is still a largely manual process. There have been suggested a couple of algorithms, but not yet in a way that uh, companies use them. Um, and optimizing this layout algorithmically is, is a challenging problem. So the different subtasks that you need to solve when you want to construct such an octilinear layout is that, well, your input is a geographically embedded railway graph, say. So you know where the stations are, and you know how the uh, rail tracks are maybe laid out um, and you know which uh, train line serves which sequence of stations. And now we want some kind of optimal layout and we need to define what optimal means. We can just divide this problem into several subtasks. Maybe one is about rendering and design choices, so what color do I use, how do I represent my stations, what kind of font do I use. All of this is important for usability, 
um, but it's not really a computational problem. Yeah. Um, the next thing is the network layout. This is where graph drawing comes in. So we want the new distorted geometry of the, of the network in order to be able to read that quickly. Then there is also a labeling problem involved because all these nodes come with station names and you need to make sure that there's enough space to place these names. Yeah. So you, the most compact network is maybe not the best one because you need to fit labels. And then finally, I don't know how this is in Tehran, but um, in some networks the same subsequence of stations is used by several subway lines. Yeah. So they can share certain parts of the network and then you can minim uh, op optimize the, the ordering of these colored lines in the network layout in order, for example, to minimize crossings. Yeah, so if you, if you imagine there's a bundle of four lines and then some split off to the left, some to the right, ideally you find an order where this can be done without crossings. Yeah, so this is also um, a problem, but we, we're not going to talk about that today. Um, so mostly about the layout and a little bit about the labels. So if we want to formalize this, um, the input is a graph, vertex set, edge set, and the set of metro lines, so we know some path cover basically of that graph. And we want to now again define layout constraints as kind of drawing conventions that must be satisfied, and then also some optimization objective functions. Um, and in order to, to find those, well, because it's an application problem, you can look at what human graphic designers do and try to extract what properties they commonly try to optimize. Um, this is a list of possible design rules. The weighting of those and the selection is, of course, um, specific to how you want your network to be drawn. But I think what is very clear is that you should not uh, play with the network topology. Okay, so if you have some lines and you know that one goes to, to the left of some other line or goes to the north of the city, you do not want to change the embedding in the sense of drawing it to the south. Yeah? So something would be wrong here. And also, Usually these networks are planar and you want to keep that planar embedding. If they are non-planar because you have crossing lines without a station, which sometimes happens, you, you just keep that. Yeah? Um, then, because we are in the sch angular schematization setting here, we want to restrict the edge orientations. Uh, so mostly we have these octilinear systems. I would say 90 to 95 percent of the networks do this. But just to show you what's also around there is other linearity or schematic systems. So some networks um, play with curved lines, which are also kind of homogeneous, easy to follow, maybe better than a sequence of many bands. But this is still kind of uh, exotic. Yeah? Um, but you can also try to do this maybe just with six directions instead of eight. Yeah? And for some cities, this would work. This is kind of a design experiment. It's not like the Berlin map actually looks like this. Um, it's an octilinear map, but um, there are designers playing with different, different ways of doing this. Then one of the most important um, optimization criteria is to remove the number of, or to reduce the number of bands. And so this is similar to what we did for orthogonal layouts. Um, in London, for example, you see that this red line actually goes in an S shape through the city. And if you look at the map, it's totally straightened. Yeah. And this, of course, improves the readability because the map would otherwise be very complex. And this is um, maybe a bad example of Madrid, where they use orthogonal style. But if you do orthogonal style for metro map, you will have many bends, and all the bends are 90 degrees. So it's uh, probably not a very smooth and easy to read map. Um, some, some um, other criteria, for example, if you have an interchange station, ideally your lines should pass straight. Yeah, so, so that when you, when you see this, you immediately know, okay, red comes in from the left, it should go out to the right. And not somehow locally change this. Um, maybe have large angles, if possible. So if we can distribute this, um, then it's better to have it like that in comparison to 45 degree and 135. Um, also, do not distort the geography more than necessary. Uh, so maybe that could be an optimization criterion if you know roughly how these lines are oriented in the city. If there's no need to change that, maybe keep it. Yeah. Because people use subway maps and also topographic maps and 
if the match is good, it's better. Um, uniform edge length, that's clear. Um, that ideally you want to stations evenly distributed. Um, if you have unrelated features, then keep some minimum distance because otherwise this might imply maybe from this terminal station you can walk over here, while in reality this is maybe five kilometers. Yeah. So keep distances apart. Um, and the last thing is to maybe distribute your drawing evenly, uniformly over the area that you're given. So avoid large empty spaces, but sometimes large empty spaces are good because you can put a legend or something like that. Um, yes. So that's a number of design rules that you can implement um, and you need to put a weighting and to decide what is so important that it's a drawing convention and what is just something that you want to optimize. Okay. Um, also, many of those things are actually conflicting, like we've seen before. So if you, if you do fewer bands, you have higher distortion, for example. Yeah. Um, so we studied this problem um, and first looked at the complexity because now we can say, for example, we want um, to preserve the topology strictly as a drawing convention and have octilinear edges. And now what about the band minimization problem? So this is very similar to what we've seen for orthogonal graphs where we could do this with a network flow method in poly time. Um, if you add these diagonal edges, you will run into NP-hardness for the band minimization. Um, the reduction is a planar three-set reduction. For those of you who have seen many of those, um, it's, it's not surprising how it works. Of course, the gadgets themselves are, are not so obvious to, to get them, but I don't go into the proof now. Um, the important thing here is to remember is the same problem. If we just go for orthogonal layout, that's polytime. Yeah, so the diagonals make it more, di more difficult. Um, and then in order to solve this problem, what we did is we did a mixed integer programming model. So trying to um, have some linear equations that model the constraints and then define an optimization function that um, basically removes the number of, or reduces the number of bands, has short edges and so on. And how did, how did you will show you how, how we can do with the distortion. Um, so for the hard constraints, the ones that are the drawing conventions, we decided that the topology needs to be preserved, um, that all edges must be linear, um, that every edge has a minimum length, so it doesn't get too short, and every non-adjacent pair of features must be apart by some minimum distance d. Um, and then for the optimization, we want to have few bands, yeah, so we need to count somehow the number of bands. Um, then minimize distortion, and we do this in, in, like in, in the objective function as a measure that um, tells you how much di distortion you might have, and then ideally you keep that small. And minimize the total edge length in order to keep the drawing somehow compact. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with linear programming, integer programming, so this is just a, a quick sketch how that works in principle. Um, what you need is, um, you need linear constraints, so have a number of variables and then define a linear equation. Um, have a linear objective function and your variables are in the LP setting can be real numbers. If you do that, you can do this efficiently, solve this efficiently. So for example, you might have a constraint y is less than 0.9x plus 1.5. And in 2D, this corresponds to a line and the lower half of the pl half plane of that line. If you put a second one, maybe you want the upper half plane, this describes a, a polygon shape and you want to optimize within that polygonal region. And if your maximization is, for example, x plus 2y, then you will find that the optimum solution is at one of the corners of that method. And if you do that in higher dimensions, um, there's algorithms that do that efficiently in, in polytopes generally. So this is a convex optimization problem. If you do integer variables instead, you now restrict your feasible space to, to the grid subset of it. Um, and this is just to, to indicate that the optimum solution for the LP relaxation can be kind of far away from maybe the optimum solution that you see in the integer world. Yeah, so this is now becoming NP-hard, but in reality you can solve many things with ILP models if your instances are not 
too complex or not too big. Um, and what we what we did is basically taking the hard constraints, model them by linear constraints and the soft constraints in the objective function. I don't go over all of them, but um, maybe just um, show a little bit how the model works. So we want to assign at most eight directions to each edge. In order to do this, we use integer variables that go from zero to seven, say. Um, so we subdivide the plane into these eight sectors of 45 degree angles and then um, make sure that if you choose an edge UV and you want to assign a direction, uh, for example, it should go horizontally to the left, then this corresponding variable should get the value 4. Yeah, so that's just a discretization of the suitable slopes that we can have here. And in order to deal with the coordinates, we did an auxiliary system that is kind of redundant, um, but just to have a coordinate in all four slopes that we have. Yeah. And then one way of getting this octilinearity correctly and also restricting the distortion to some sense is to say if your input edge was maybe having this slope here, then the best match in our octilinear coordinate system would be to use the dark blue slope, so diagonally down left. But we say, okay, in order to not dis distort too much, we can also use the horizontal adjacent direction and the vertical adjacent direction. So we have a choice between these th three options. And now for modeling this um, with linear constraints, what you can do is you can define binary variables that can take value 0 or 1 and make sure the sum of these three is 1. So we need to make a decision, choose one of them. And now we can use this variable in the constraint set and say that, for example, if we want to go to the left here, and if we choose that direction, then alpha is taking the value 1 here. Okay, so we have 1 minus 1, which is 0. And this simply means that the y-coordinate of u is less than the y-coordinate of v, and the y-coordinate of v is also less or equal to the y-coordinate of u. So they must be equal. Okay, if y-coordinates are equal, we get a horizontal line already. And the third constraint makes sure that um, v is actually left of u. Yeah, so it's moving to the left. If we do not choose that direction, so alpha is 0, then there's a large constant m, so that all these constraints are trivially satisfied. So only if we select alpha, then this is actually happening. And you do this um, for all three of the sectors. Oh, OK, I already explained that. Um, you do this for all three of the sectors, and then the choice of which alpha to take basically tells you how to draw that edge. OK, for the objective function, um, of course, there's other hard constraints. I just showed one example. We have the number of bands that we want to minimize, the, the total edge length, and the distortion, basically. And these form the three parts of the objective function. If we care about the bends, um, the cost scheme that we apply here is that if the angle is a very small angle, it costs you three units of cost. If you have a 90 degree angle, it's two. This bend is the best bend if you need one, because it's kind of continuing the line of direction. If you can do without the bend, perfect, zero cost, and then it increases again. Okay, and you need to put the linear constraints that actually model this kind of cost scheme. Um, and then once you have that, you sum up over all your subway lines, over all adjacent pairs of edges, this bent cost. So this gives you the bent cost function. And in a similar way, you do for distortion and for total edge length. So what this gives you is um, a quadratic number of variables and constraints, because we need to make sure that planarity is satisfied. So for every pair of edge, we need to make sure they don't intersect. Um, the objective function consists of three terms that we can put with different priorities. Um, and the effect is that, depending on how you choose this, you get very different layouts. So if you only focus on band minimization, you get something that's almost straight. The bends that you see here, they come from the upper bound on the distortion because this was maybe a line that was going downwards, so we cannot make it horizontal. Okay. If you go for minimizing distortion, then this is basically snapping the layout to the closest orientations for all edges. Okay. And if you do this in a balanced way, um, then maybe you get a layout that is comparable to what human designers do. Okay, so I guess I'm almost done here. Um, maybe show you 
show you one example for a larger network map. So this is uh, the network of Sydney in Australia. Um, and if you, if you run this uh, integer programming model that I have sketched for quite a long time, so this is after 10 and a half hours, you get a labeled map. So I didn't speak much about the labeling, but I think tomorrow or the day after we, we have time for labeling problems. Um, this is 10 and a half hours. You can actually get quite similar drawings in much less time, but they are not optimum. And here you, you go towards a better solution. Um, this is some more recent work from, I think, EuroCG last year, where people took that model, engineered it a bit more to actually draw very huge networks like Tokyo. Um, but maybe in terms of bands, this is also not yet something that designers can work with. Yeah. OK, so in terms of uh, discussion, the, the good things of this integer programming framework is that it's kind of, fle kind of flexible. So if you want to add more constraints or modify things, it's usually easy to do if you, if you can express your stuff with linear constraints. Um, and the quality, because you do global optimization, if your objective function is modeled correctly, <coughs> gives you a high quality. Um, but on the downside, the running times can be long, um, which is maybe OK if you want to design a new network map for a city to run it overnight, that's fine. Um, but if you want to do this individually on demand on your device, that's not a solution here. Um, yes. These are the references if you're more interested in, in reading up. And uh, let me close again with an overview of some open research directions. Not as concrete as yesterday, maybe. But in terms of, of octilinear maps, it's interesting to explore other linearities. So maybe hexilinear layouts where you have 60-degree um, angles. Um, what's also currently not modeled well is more global properties, like balance of the map or optimize for many parallel lines, because this is kind of giving you a harmonic map. Um, or p using this metaphor for visualizing other kind of data. So for example, if you have a set system or a hypergraph, <coughs> depending on how you prefer to do this, um, the question is, can you use this kind of idea to represent that hypergraph? Yeah, so your subway lines would be hyper edges. And now you have much more freedom. You can choose the order of your elements along the lines. You can choose the embedding. All of that is not fixed anymore if you do uh, abstract data. Um, and the last question maybe refers to the orthogonal world. Um, People studied um, greedy rectilinear drawings, um, where greedy means, um, I mean, maybe we can do details in, in, in the afternoon session. Yeah. But let, let me just put that, that also in, in the orthogonal world, there's still, still open problems. OK, thank you. For the subway map? Yeah. Um, we didn't put it on a web page because it's kind of a very prototypical code. Um, but if someone is interested, I'm happy to share it. I will be interested to play with the code yes. and see how it's out. And the second question is usually the issue with the metro maps is like, uh, I know my destination. I know a closed POI, mm -hmm. point of interest to that one. Yes. But I cannot find the closed station to that POI mm -hmm. because there is no constraint yeah. of the city yes. in the map. So is there a version of the study that they, they put some kind of I mean, POIs, and then say the closeness to these POIs mm -hmm. and the station should be, should, should be considered. Yes, I mean, basically, you can model this with labels, say, yeah, yeah. putting extra labels that say this is, uh, I don't know, some, some point of interest in the city. But I mean, the closeness um, of the station to that POI. Oh, OK. Um, if, if it's a, a limited small number of POIs, you can maybe indicate this in the map somehow that the walking distance from here to that station is two minutes and here it's five minutes. Um, but now this comes into uh, the area where you need maybe on-demand maps because, because your POIs might not be someone else's POIs. And then if you need your personalized map, then yeah, maybe an ILP is too, too slow for that. Yeah. But there are, there are works that do, um, for example, photo annotation with the subway network. So that could be similar, something that can be used. So we'll take a 30 minute oh, question. Uh, maybe I can talk on this for the for the So 30 minutes break, and then we start uh, 15 minutes to 11. Mm -hmm.
many students, I mean, mm -hmm. undergrads, are mm -hmm. interested in like implementation of this uh, algorithm. Okay. So I, I guess we can, we can uh, define some projects for undergrads. You know, Possibly, to, yeah. To yeah. play with this, yeah. Mm -hmm. with this yeah. Project. So I, I currently have a student who. Oh, maybe I should turn off the mic.